Hi everyone. This teaching or sermon and the points in the scriptures I will use will surprise many of you. Don't assume you know what I'm going to say because you look at the title or the subheadings. I'm sure you're going to be surprised. But be sure you also have first printed out the notes so you can follow along as I'm going to be racing through a lot of scriptures and it'll be a lot easier for you to follow along if indeed you have the scriptures printed out in front of you already. So let's start with a quick quiz for everybody. According to the Bible, quick quiz, who created everything? That might be a little bit of a trick question, but do your best. God the Father, or the Son of God, or something else. Second question, who is our Savior? Is it the Father, God Most High, in other words, or Jesus, or both? <clears throat> Third question, who was the God of the Old Testament, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to Peter and Paul and lots of scripture, who was the God of the Old Testament? Was it God Most High, Jesus Christ, the Word, or both? And then in part two, when I do the second part of this sermon, I ask things like when the Bible says the Lord, Lord all in caps, Yehovah or Yahweh, Y-H-V-H, who is that? Is that always and just God Most High, always and just the Word, or is it both? Are both of them called Y-H-V-H? VH. There's confusion on these points and we need to find out the truth. Remember, we are flesh, by the way, trying to explain God who is spirit. So good luck with that, right? <laughs> God who is spirit. And we need to answer these questions by choosing one or the other. We think, I, I, I meant we tend to answer these questions by choosing one or the other. We tend to, it's an either or answer. Instead of considering if it's possible, that the full answer could be both God Most High and the Word Jesus Christ. We only see in part 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 12 say, but we will do our best. But I know there's a lot missed by some Sabbath-keeping groups, Protestants and Catholics alike. Why is this topic so important? Jesus said, Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and truth. John 4, 24 said that to the Samaritan woman at the well. <clears throat> so certainly what we say and teach about him needs to be the truth. If we don't understand the concepts in this teaching today, you'll struggle understanding who did what, when, was it God Most High, was it the Word, was it both of them working together. You'll be surprised by the sermon, I think. You'll wonder at times, who's the one doing what and when? But what I've seen also is that because so many of you have been have incomplete understandings, we end up sidelining either God the Father a lot or sometimes sidelining Jesus Christ. Everything you read about God in the Old Testament, that's Jesus. Is that true? That's what's being written and said by many. Others believe it's all God the Father, God Most High. Others think it was a cruel, mean God in the Old Testament. Anyway, if you're wondering where the Holy Spirit is in all of this, see my other new sermons, video sermons on that. This may also eventually become a video sermon as well. <clears throat> but of all things, let's not eliminate God Most High because of our misunderstanding. God Most High, who became the Father, is active, has always been active, always is active and in the middle of everything going on in the universe. Though he delegates a lot to Christ, he still is overseeing everything, as you will see. You heard me right. He is and always has been active. So, hello everyone. I'm Philip Shields. With Light on the Rock, we try our best to build a stronger connection, stronger knowledge, awareness of our God and of our Savior, as well as a stronger connection between people. Understanding how God Most High works with the Word, who became flesh as Jesus from time to time immemorial, will help us to work with God better. We'll also have to go over the concept of God as one. We'll have to go over that. Uh, the Echad. Uh, 
Behold, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. Deuteronomy 6, 4. The word in Hebrew is E-C-H-A-D, pronounced Echad. It's not Echad or Echad, it's Echad. I think many of you will find that fascinating when we go through it, maybe in part two. Um, very, very fascinating. So let's start with who is the creator. Be ready. Some of you will be surprised. Is it just Jesus? Is it just God Most High? Could it be both? I think most of you have come to, who come to this website, Light on the Rock, know very well about John 1, verses 1 to 3, and that clearly says Jesus was the actual one creating everything out there, and nothing out there that we see or know about was created except by Jesus. Okay, so that seems clear. Colossians 1, 15 to 17 says the same thing. Jesus was there with God Most High from the very beginning. He says in John 17, verses 4 and 5, he says, I have glorified you on earth. I've finished the work you've given me to do. And now, remember who's giving orders here. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory that you had, I'm, I'm sorry, with the glory I had with you before the world was. So let's read John 1, verses 1 to 3 again. But as we go through this, I think you're going to see much, much more than you might have before. John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. By the way, Genesis 1, 1 starts with the same words, in the beginning. But in Genesis 1, 1, the word za is not in the Hebrew. It just says, in beginning, God created the heavens and earth. I think that's interesting too. Verse 3, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Seems pretty clear. Here come the surprises, though, in, the, in about five minutes. <laughs> the word became flesh, verse 14. We know that word is Jesus Christ. Yeshua, Jesus, was always there from the beginning with God. Jesus is not a created being, but is God himself, as we've just read, and has always been under God Most High. The head of Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Notice how Jesus describes his relationship with God Most High. He says, I've done the work, I've finished the work you've given me to do, John 17, 4. And notice also how Jesus says, even while preaching and doing all those marvelous miracles, walking on water, healing the sick, raising the dead, so many, many miracles, notice whom he says was doing the actual work, but through him, and what his own role was. John 12, 49. John 12, 49. I said print the notes out because if I have to stop and take time for all of you to turn to these verses in your own Bibles, um, we'll never get through this. I have so many scriptures. John 12, 49. I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say, what I should speak. Okay, I want you to grasp what he's saying here. I'm under my Father. I do what my Father says. John 14, 10. <clears throat> oh, that we could say it so truthfully ourselves, about ourselves. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, in me, that's through the Holy Spirit. And if you hear my new sermon on the Spirit, this will be clearer too. The Father who dwells in me, and he also will dwell in us. 14.23, John 14.23 says that, if we abide in his word. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. So the multiplying of the bread and the fish other places, Jesus said, I can't do anything by myself. Nothing. So who did it? The Father who dwells in me, John 14, 10, does the works. So it's easy for us to say the creator of all things is clearly Christ Jesus. So many verses say so. But once again, the one who originates everything, plans everything, 
makes final decisions, has final authority, gives final commands, was God and is God most high, God the Father. He's the one who reserves to himself, by the way, the calling, your calling, my calling. It's amazing. Anyway, the Father, who then brought everything into existence through Jesus, using their Holy Spirit. I'll prove it all with Scripture shortly. <clears throat> For example, did Henry Ford build thousands and thousands and thousands of Ford cars? That's a yes and no answer, isn't it? He built a lot of cars, or did he? Wasn't it the assembly workers and their supervisors who did the building, the producing, the making, the creating? Think of Henry Ford as in the role of the father. He didn't do the physical building of the cars, but everything was his idea, his factories, his plans. He was quite a mechanic himself. Ford worked through the workers. Did Henry build a lot of cars? Yes. Did he use others to do it? Yes. We'll see God the Father is the ultimate Henry Ford of creation. He created all things through Jesus Christ. If that's so, then both are the creator. All those people who created the Ford cars could not have done so without Ford's money, Ford's plants, assembly plants, and Ford's designs. So they both were involved. Both were creators. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. God. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at various times, in various ways, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. God spoke through by the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, through whom also he, God, is the topic, through whom he, God, made the worlds. It doesn't contradict John 1, saying God, it was God's plan, God, God's ideas, God's command, God's will. He made everything. God the Father made everything, created everything through the Son. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Ephesians 3, verse 9. <clears throat> you don't get these read to you so often, do you? And to make all see what's the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. God created everything using Jesus Christ. So who created everything? Are you seeing why I say the answer has to be, if you want to be 100% correct, both. Now, Revelation 4, you might, might want to read the whole chapter yourself. It's about God the Father on his throne. Jesus, the Lamb of God, does not come into the picture until the next chapter. At the end of chapter 4, we read of the four living creatures who had six wings, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. <clears throat> and then the 24 elders bow down, cast their crowns in worship. And then we read this, directed at God Most High, at God the Father. The Lamb is not in the room yet. Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created by God's will they exist and were created and the other verses we read said through Jesus Christ so knowing God the Father originates all things and tells the word what he wants to get done it's perfectly clear to me God the Father is very, very involved in creation. He is very and very involved in everything. He was very, very involved, involved with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Israel. And he does it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Even when it says the Lord 
uh, spoke with Samuel, 1 Samuel 3, I think the last verse or two, he spoke to Samuel through the word of God. Go back and read that if you haven't noticed that before. It just came to me. I'm going to have to add it to my notes here. It just came to me now. Uh, uh, it's 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 3. Uh, I don't know what verse it is. The very last verse or two is all I know. But go back and read it. It's interesting. God the Father, God Most High, spoke to the prophet Samuel, even as a child, through the Word of God. Anyway, now we are now we move on to other questions. I hope you're getting excited about this. Let's review some more before we do, though, the, the, get the answers to other questions. Review the relationship between Jesus, the Word of God, and God Most High, or God the Father. How do they work? First of all, let's remember, God says He doesn't change, Malachi 3, 5. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8, I believe. The Malachi 3, 5 says, I am Jehovah, the Lord. I do not change. Therefore, you're not consumed, O sons of Jacob. <clears throat> what he's saying is, I'm a very patient, long-suffering being. Therefore, you're not consumed. I'm still patient with you. God Most High has always been God Most High. The head of Christ is God, 1 Corinthians 11.3. In fact, God Most High is the God of Jesus Christ. How often are you getting that preached at whatever church you go to, whether it's Sabbath-keeping or Protestant or Catholic? How many times do you hear that Jesus has a God? Have you ever heard that last sentence I said preached? That Jesus has a God over him. God the Father has no God over him. Because he's it. He's number one. Ephesians 1, three, Just the first part of it. Blessed be the God and Father. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.17, first part of the verse. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, did you realize Jesus has a God? That Jesus worships his God as well? Of course, you remember how Jesus told Mary, John 20, 17, after his resurrection, Mary, don't cling to me, don't hold on to me, don't touch me, whatever. The word can mean either one, by the way. But Jesus told Mary that he had to go to my God and your God. There's another account, I think the account in Matthew, I think it is, where a bunch of women saw him. Jesus ran into a bunch of them returning from the tomb, and they all grabbed his feet. It's the same word there about touch, cling. They all grabbed his feet, and there he doesn't tell them. He still hasn't gone to heaven yet, but there he doesn't tell them to, you can't touch me. I just think that's interesting. I'll put in my notes what that scripture is, just, just because. Just because I'm a nice guy. Did you realize that Jesus has a God over him? There are so many other scriptures that support that. Uh, Revelation 3, verse 12, where he says, I'll put on you the name of the city of my God, and you will be pillars in the temple of my God. Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6. Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9. They're all in the notes. Mark 15, 34, and other places where Jesus has a God. That God is God the Father most high. God in the highest, who doesn't have anybody higher than him. That's why he's called God in the highest. That, that was the wording the, the angels sang to the shepherds, remember, God in the highest. Jesus has always been under the Father, and at the end of the millennium, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, I'll put it in my notes, I'll just read verse 28. When everything's put under Christ's feet, um, it says in verse 27, first of all, that God has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, he's not including himself. God the Father. God the Father was never under Christ's authority. So when all things are put under Christ, that's ex ex exempting God the Father. Verse 28, now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him. 
that God may be all in all. So at that point, even, we will all see Jesus Christ himself bowing down to God the Father. <clears throat> now, every word Jesus spoke, every deed he did was by the Father's direction and control. I've already quoted these, but let's look at them again. Uh, Jesus even said he could do nothing of himself. John 12, 49, the Father who sent me a command, that's what I do. John 14, 10, he says, the words I speak to you, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who dwells in me does the works. The one healing people is me. I can't do anything. I'm just flesh and blood. But God is in me. I was conceived of the Holy Spirit. I had fullness of the Holy Spirit without measure, without limit. Like it says, I think in Luke 1 someplace. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. And then John 8, 28, 29, I can do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. John 5, 19, Christ always did what his Father wanted. John 5, 30, I can do myself nothing. John 6, 38, I've come to do the will of him who sent me. Can you see that Jesus is under the command of the Father? My Father and I, I and my Father are one, John 10, 30. They've always been so in tune, you would think it was one being working. Perfectly, perfectly synced together. Jesus obeying every whim and will of the Father. It's got to be better even than horse and rider. They, they do say that a really good rider with a really good horse, you can't tell where one begins and where the one ends. I mean, they're, they're just, you know, this would be even more so, much more so. So this concept of being one does not mean just one person. In fact, all of us are supposed to be as one with each other and with God, as Jesus and the Father are with each other, one. But a lot of persons are involved when you talk about all of us. I'll explain that far more when I get into part two, the Lord is one, Deuteronomy 6.4, it'll, it'll baffle you. It's amazing. <clears throat> Talked at length with a rabbi about that and uh, confounded him. So I'll, I'll tell all that in part two. John 17, verses 20, 23. I don't pray for these, okay, the remaining 11 disciples who are there alone, but also all who believe in me through their word. That's us. He's not talking about us. All who will believe in me through their word, their, the written word, that they all, that's you and me and all of us, may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. You, Father, are in me that they may be one in us. That's how we become one together, by being one in Father and Son. That the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I've given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Are you getting the idea that he wants us together, not all split up into, what a horrible word we've come up with, splinter group, splinters hurt. Splinters can infect you. You ought to go back and read 1 Corinthians 1.10. God is not pleased with divisions. He'll allow them. He might even cause some. That there, there must be divisions among you that those who, are, those who are accredited and known of God may be found out. It's another verse that says that. I think that's in 1 Corinthians 11, but I'm not sure. God the Father has always been God most high, God in the highest. Jesus, the Word of God, has always been second in command to God most high. Always. The Word has always done the will of the Father. Always. I change not. I do not change. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever, will always be the same. You'll see how one they are, how perfectly one they are. If Jesus does the Father's will perfectly, this has been the pattern from way before time began. God Most High coming up with His will, His plans, His directions, and then Jesus, the Word, implementing 
the Father's will, always, from the beginning and continuing that way. I just read to you the very end of the millennium when Jesus himself, who, under whom all things were put under him, uh, will be subjecting himself once again to Father. Now, with that in mind, I hope you're getting a clue here when I ask the question, who is the Savior? Is it just Jesus? Is it just the Father? Could it be both? Most of you will instinctively answer, well, of course it's Jesus who is our Savior. And of course, there are many, many, many verses that call Jesus our Savior. He's the one who saves us. I'm not denying that. Is he the only one? Hebrews 5, 9, the last part of it. He, Christ, became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We do have to obey. We obey through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. We obey through Christ living in us. We have to obey. I just read it. Hebrews 5, 9, the last part of it. <clears throat> Acts 4, 11 and 12. This is the stone rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. There is no salvation in any other. No, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Speaking of Jesus Christ. So certainly he is the Savior. The shepherds were told in Luke 2, 11, There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, the anointed one. That's what that means, Christ the Lord. He's called the Savior to these while he was still a baby. 1 John 4.14 4, We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. And so many other verses. I'll print out a few more in my notes. You can read them later. We also eagerly wait for the Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.20 Our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 On and on and on and on. But... Are we going to sideline God the Father as Savior? This will be nothing new for some of you, but very surprising for some of you. Who started the plan to save humanity? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life god sent not his son god sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved who started the plan god so loved the world who is the one who calls us who called you so you could be saved. Was it Jesus? No, it was God the Father who called you. In fact, we're told in Romans 2, 4 that it's God, God the Father's mercy that leads us to repentance. Romans 2, 4. The mercy of God leads us to repentance. God then leads us to Jesus as we're being called. He then hands us over to Jesus be part of his flock for Jesus to work with, John 6, 65. John 6, 65. Jesus in turn then reveals the Father to all of us. God called us, he worked with us, he led us to repentance, and we had no clue who that was. So now Jesus is going to reveal Father to us, Matthew eleven twenty seven. Do you see Father and Son working together as Savior? It is incomplete. I don't know that it's wrong to say Jesus is our Savior. It's incomplete. Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. You want to know Father? Ask Jesus in prayer to reveal him to you. Ask Father in prayer to have Jesus reveal him to you. They work as one, as one. But there's so many verses that clearly say God the Father also is called our Savior. Why aren't we hearing that? 
We always hear, I mean, even the Protestant churches, uh, it's always Jesus and the cross of Jesus and all that. And where's God the Father? He's sidelined in so many places. Catholic Church, it's Mary, Mary, Mary. They talk about God too. I shouldn't just say just Mary, but it's not sidelined the Father. Sometimes in some verses within a verse or two, it says God our Savior and Jesus our Savior. Clearly showing both are our Savior. Let's read a few. First Timothy 1 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. So God our Savior here is not talking about Jesus because that's a separate clause. God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to, to be saved. That's God's God's, he's talking about God wanting everyone to be saved. He is our Savior. So if anyone talks about the, our Savior, you should be immediately from now on thinking it's both. God the Father starts the process, and then he works through Jesus Christ, just like he did with creation. 1 Timothy 4.10. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 4.10. To this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. God, who is the Savior. Titus 2.10, not pilfering, but showing all fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Jude 25, to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, and so on. Now we have a couple of verses I'm going to read where it combines both of them as Savior within the same passage. In Titus especially this is done. Titus chapter 1. If you didn't print these notes out, you're going to have to be writing like crazy if you want to go back and read these. Titus 1 verses 3 and 4 shows that both of them are Savior. Don't leave God out. Has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior, to Titus, a true son in the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Paul's saying, guys, be aware, God the Father is our Savior, Christ is our Savior. I want to point something else out here, by the way. In all of these where they're talking about God our Savior, Jesus our Savior, if the, if the Holy Spirit was a third person in a trinity, he's not being mentioned in any of this sermon I've given so far. In any of these scriptures. Because Holy Spirit is not our Savior. As a third person at least. <clears throat> I hope you hear that video. Just what is, who is our um, who is the, the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, verses 4 to 6, When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, God our Savior, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. He didn't save us because we were righteous. He saved us because He was merciful. Through whom the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you hear my sermon on who and what the Holy Spirit is, you'll understand that verse. This is the one place where being saved, Holy Spirit is mentioned, the washing, regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus becomes our life, remember. Now what about all the verses that say there's no other Savior but Jesus, Acts 4.12? Remember God the Father and Jesus are so unified they are seen as one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Philip. It's in John 14 as well, I believe. 
One is co-op, they're one in a cooperative union. Both of them are savior. Both of them are creator. God most high is God over all, that he may be all in all. So who's our savior? The complete correct answer is both God the Father and his son. Jesus Christ, our, our savior. By the way, I don't have time to get into it here, but also both are called the redeemer. Christ is God is. Now, a bigger question. So far, God the Father and Jesus both create. Henry Ford, remember, through the workers. In this case, the workers, symbolized by Jesus Christ. God the Father created all things through Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3, 9. God our Savior, Jesus our Savior. Both are our Savior, according to Titus. Now, who was God of the Old Testament? When we read God, the word God in the Old Testament scriptures and the Hebrew scriptures called the Tanakh, is that referring to God the Father? Many of you who come to my site will say no. Is it referring to the word Jesus as the God of the Old Testament, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I will show you that a lot of that will be determined by context. But to say, as some people do, some ministers do, that the God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ all the time, I have to ask myself, where then did God Most High go? And what scriptures are they reading that I'm not reading? What am I reading that they're not? So you'll see what it means. It doesn't fit the pattern of what I've explained, that God Most High, the Father, somehow disappears for 4,000 years in the entirety of the Old Testament. So therefore, the God of the Old Testament is always referring to the one who became Jesus, as some groups teach, as some ministers, many ministers teach. I don't. Because it's not true. It's not complete. The God who became Jesus was very active indeed in the Old Testament and called God many times, what's called Yehovah many times, Y-H-V-H. But you'll see it's incorrect that it was always just Jesus who was the sole God of the Old Testament. It's equally incorrect, as I'll show you, to say that God in the Old Testament was the mean and cruel God Most High. There's at least one group I know of who sidelined Jesus. Yehovah, even the one who was seen by Abraham, was God most high, they say. No, it can't be. That had to be the one who was, became the word because nobody, no human being, has ever seen God the Father, John 1.18 says, Jesus speaking, or speaking about Jesus and his Father. But then after Jesus came, the more gentle being, the word who became Jesus is the God of the New Testament. That is just wrong. They're both involved involved in both testaments. There are clear scriptures I'm about to show you. God Most High was overall God of the Old Testament, again working through, like I told you, sec, keep saying Second Samuel, it's 1 Samuel 3, the last verse or so, if I can be looking it up while I talk to you about that, is a real good example of what I'm talking about. How God the Father worked even with Samuel, through the word. I'll read it. Second Samuel, here we go, go ahead. It's first Samuel 1, first of all, verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. So Samuel grew, verse 19. The Lord, Jehovah, was with him. So everybody knew that Samuel was a prophet. Verse 21. Then the Lord, Jehovah, appeared again in Shiloh, for Jehovah revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. I think word should be capitalized there. It's talking about the one who became Jesus. The Lord, Father in heaven, God Almighty, revealed himself to Samuel by the word of the Lord. And then Ezekiel and Zechariah and Isaiah, and so, but Ezekiel especially. 
Then the word of the Lord came to me and said, I think in many cases those are Jesus Christ, directly. So I'm not saying Jesus wasn't God of the Old Testament. I'm saying he couldn't be the only one in the, it doesn't follow the pattern that God the Father is God most high, God giving the orders, God giving his will. So God most high must always be God the Father. Jesus is called the Son of the Most High God, Son of God in the highest. Luke 2.14. It's inconceivable to me that God Most High wasn't intricately involved, everything, in everything, from even before creation onwards. That God Most High wasn't involved with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're going to see that in just a second. Remember, though, no one has seen God at the Father at any time. <clears throat> now let's jump over to Genesis 14, verses 18 to 23. Who was Melchizedek? Many of you believe that was a theophany or a showing of Jesus Christ. Perhaps so. Probably so. But notice what happened after the battle that Abraham had. Genesis 14, verses 18 to 23. Notice the wording. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him. That's God the Father, God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High. The connection was with God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who's delivered your enemies into your hand. In this case, he's saying God Most High gave you the victory, was right there in the battle, gave you the victory. And Abraham gave him a tithe of all. And then verse 22, Abraham says to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord, Jehovah, God Most High. So he knows that Jehovah is someone being called God Most High the possessor of heaven and earth. Don't miss that. Now, Abram of God Most High equally exactly corresponds to what Peter says. I'm telling you, God Most High does not disappear from being active in the Old Testament. Everything of God begins with God Most High. He stays involved working through Jesus Christ as creator, as savior, and as God of the Old Testament. Now read, Peter is standing in front um, in Acts 5, verse 30 to 31. He's giving a testimony about Jesus Christ. And let me just see the context of this. If I can get my fingers to work. I paid $1,000 on my teeth and now my fingers won't work. Okay. John 5, John 5, Acts 5. You guys got to interpret for me. Peter and the other apostles is saying to these people who wanted to uh, make them stop preaching, he says in Acts 5.30, Acts 5.30, the God of our fathers, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you murdered. So the God of our fathers raised up Jesus who is God of our fathers. He's got to be talking about God Most High. Raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree, him God has exalted to his right hand. Okay? Now go back to Acts 3, 13. Peter didn't know that the God of the Old Testament was Jesus. He says the God of our fathers raised up Jesus. Acts 3, 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, who was determined to let him go. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I read an article where the minister was saying that Abraham never thought of God Almighty as, as God. He, he always knew it was Jesus. Because he uses the verse where uh, Abraham saw my day and was delighted. 
had great joy in seeing my day. Well, here Peter says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. Are you getting it? Before you start worrying about me, yes, Jesus was God of the Old Testament sometimes. Every time Jehovah was seen, that had to be Jesus. Every time he was heard, probably was Jesus. Maybe even had to be Jesus. But don't sideline the Father. He's very active, as you're going to see. Peter understood the Old Testament God to be God Most High. So did Paul. Here's one from Paul, Acts 22, verse 12 to 14. He's recounting the story of his calling on the road to Damascus. Acts 22, 12 to 14. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. He stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that same hour, another place says that very moment, I looked up at him and I, I could see again. Verse 14, Acts 22, 14. And then he, Ananias, said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one. That's Jesus. The God of our fathers wants you to see Jesus, he's saying, and hear the voice of his mouth. I think it's pretty clear that they thought who, they knew who God of the Old Testament was. Now let's read some more. Psalm 57, verse 2 and 3. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. Seems pretty busy to David. He thought, he thought God was being pretty busy. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. Now God most high is Elyon, means most high. The notion some have that God Most High kept his distance from Israel and world events is simply wrong. That was not the eternal pattern, and that's not what Scripture shows us. God Most High set the plan, implemented them through the Word, and kept very actively involved, watching and being involved. We both know, we all know, God could refer to Jesus Christ, obviously. But whenever you have the phrase, God Most High, or Most High God, that is solely the place for God the Father. Jesus Christ is never God Most High. Can't be. That would be usurping the God because it's very clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that God exempted himself from, he said, I put all things under your feet. Except himself. <clears throat> Psalm 78, 17. They, Israel, sinned more against him, even more, by rebelling against the Most High. In the wilderness. Looks to me like God most high is being active here. Psalm 78 35. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. Who was the rock that followed them? First Corinthians 10 4 says it was Christ. Psalm 78 35 says God was their rock, the most high God. Who was the rock that followed them? If you want a complete answer, if you combine those two verses, it's both. Both. God is not sidelined. God is not being retired. Psalm 78, verse 56. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God. They didn't just provoke the one we know as Jesus. Did not keep his testimony. I think God Most High is clearly being involved. Now the one who spoke the Ten Commandments, who appeared... And, and and showed himself to um, the back, showed his back to Moses um, in the cleft of the rock. That had to be Jesus, for no one has seen God the Father. So who's God of the Old Testament? Both are. David says some more things here. Psalm 110, verse 1. Yehovah, the Lord all caps. Okay said to Adonai, to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This is clearly, even in the New Testament, proving that David understood that there was Jehovah, Most High, and there was Adonai, my Lord. 
sitting at his right hand. Here, he's speaking of two individuals. Yehovah, the I am, and my Lord, Adonai. Adon means Lord, and when you put AI, it means my, my Lord. And then Psalm 2 is the same. Uh, today I've begotten you. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Because no one has seen Jehovah, who was God the Father, John 1, 18. John 6, 45, 46. But many have seen, many have seen Jehovah. So that Jehovah who was seen, maybe Adam and Eve saw him. It was Yehovah who formed Adam in, that, in Genesis 2. I said to say Yehovah, your Bible will say the Lord in all caps. There's no the, there's no article in the Hebrew. Lord does, is not what it sounds like, is not what it means. The word is Yehovah. Some of you prefer Yahweh, but it's certainly not Lord. Baal, by the way, Baal. The main meaning of Baal is Lord. So think about that. Anyway, for example, Jehovah appeared to Abraham, had lunch with him, Genesis 18. Go back and read it. Plus, we read in Exodus 24 that over 70 men went up to Mount Sinai, 70 elders, plus Moses, plus Aaron, plus his two oldest son, probably Joshua too, although he's not mentioned here. So at least 74, maybe 75. Let's read it, Exodus 24, verse 9 to 11. And then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, 70 of the elders of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. Here it is the one who became Jesus Christ. And there was under his feet like a paved work of sapphire stone, in the very heavens in its clarity, like the very heavens. But God didn't lay his hands on all of them who saw him. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. So all the times it says they saw or heard Jehovah or the Lord or God in the Old Testament, that had to be the one who became Jesus. He was the Word of God. Paul also verifies that deeply, which a lot of you know clearly, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. Go back and read it on your own. That Jesus was the one working with them, but Father wasn't sidelined. I, re I just read you how they rebelled against the Most High, how they angered the Most High and everything. He was there. Who's God of the Old Testament? Who's the God of the forefathers? Peter said it was God the Father. Paul says the same thing. But whenever God in the Old Testament appeared and spoke, that had to be the one we know as the Word, Jesus Christ. For no human has ever seen God the Father, John 1.18, among other verses. So my answer has to be it was both. God of the Old Testament, you're doing a great disservice to God if you say it's just Jesus Christ. You're doing a great disservice to Jesus if you say it was just God the Father as a couple groups do that I know of. Anyway, I hope you understand the premise of that God Most High has always been active, always will be active, was the initiator of the plans, keeps his eyes on what's going on, on his will being done. He always remains active, though the one Israel and others heard and saw was the Word, was the one we know as Christ. God the Father was the one initiating everything going on. Remember Abram, Melchizedek said, Abram, of God Most High, let's not sideline any, either one. I've shown you God the Father is creator creating through Jesus Christ. Both are creator. I've shown you God the Father is Savior along with his Son. He's the one, God the Father is the one who devised the plan and sent his Son who died for us. And he voluntarily gave himself up as well. Both are our Savior. Both have to be God of our fathers or the God of Israel. As we just read in Exodus 24 10, they saw the God of Israel. And Peter and Paul said that the God of our fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, 
resurrected or whatever he says he, they did here to, to his servant Jesus. To his servant Jesus. Acts 3.13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus. In Acts 5.30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus. Are you getting it? God the Father is very involved in the Old Testament. Very involved. Don't sideline him. Next time we'll go into what it means to be one. I think you'll learn a lot when I talk about Echad. Uh, the Jews really stumble over that, and that's why they could not accept Jesus as the Son of God, because they correctly said, by saying you are the Son of God, you make yourself out to be God. Yeah. So that's why he even said, I am, a couple times. So they, they become one, absolute one. Let's dismiss with that. Please come back for part two. You'll miss a lot if you don't that others know about this. We've got to get this word out. Father in heaven, we bow our heads before you. We just ask you to dismiss us now and open our minds. Father, those who believe and have been taught that the God of the Old Testament was just Jesus, please open their minds to understand the real truth. As Peter and Paul explained, as Melchizedek explained, as David explained, that God Most High is also God of the Old Testament, the one who he used to speak, to be seen, to interact. Yes, that was indeed the one who became Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Jesus, come into our life and be our life. Be our life. Overcome in us. You've overcome all things that our lives look more and more like you. We grow in your image more and more as we focus on you as you say to do in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Thank you now for all this. We bless you and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.